Good afternoon, all. Good morning, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Secretary General of the UN. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you. Uh, I wanted to share some perspectives on the 64th session of the General Assembly and many events of the past week. It is still early days, of course, but this has been one of the most engaged GA sessions in years. Uh, there is a broad recognition of the United Nations uh, pivotal role in rising uh, to the exceptional challenges of coming years. Let me be uh, specific. <coughs> First, the climate change. We convened the largest ever summit of the climate crisis, 101 uh, heads of state and government from 163 countries uh, participated, 101 and 163 countries. We laid a s solid foundation toward uh, uh, Copenhagen. All leaders said they wanted a deal and are prepared to work for it. And this gives the negotiations a vital political impetus. Uh, leaders confirmed the need to limit the global average temperatures uh, rise to a maximum of two degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, most of vulnerable countries, like uh, small island developing states, they pushed for an even more stringent 1.5 degree uh, limit. Uh, on the mitigation front, as you know very well, the new Japanese Prime Minister Hatoyama announced a bold and ambitious goal of 25% reduction by 2020 against the level of 1990 and the intent to create a Japanese carbon market that would be linked into a global carbon market. Also on the mitigation front, the Chinese president announced China would be prepared to take additional action to reduce energy intensity in the context of an international agreement. On adaptation, the European Union announced their support for a fast track a funding facility for adaptation and their readiness to provide five to seven billion euros to get it uh, started. At long last, the leaders focused on climate change financing and got s more concrete with the many expressing support for the proposal uh, for 100 billion annually over the next decade for concrete adaptation and mitigation action. And I raised this issue again during my the participation in G20 summit meeting. There was a very intensive uh, discussions on uh, financing issues. Given the important progress achieved by leaders' involvement at the summit, <coughs> I'm committed to continuing to engage them individually and collectively in accordance with the Prime Minister of Denmark. We need to maintain the new momentum and solidify uh, progress in the run-up to Copenhagen. And that is the focus of my upcoming mission to Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Geneva, as it will be for every one of my missions from now uh, through December. Uh, second, uh, disarmament. Issues of disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation are now front and center. Not long ago, uh, few challenged the idea that nuclear weapons were here to say, stay. That is why nearly a year ago, I proposed a five-point action plan for putting disarmament back on the global agenda, including a special summit of the Security Council. Resolution 1887, unanimously adopted by the Security Council during its uh, Thursday uh, summit the meeting last week, is an important step. We continue the march for a world without nuclear weapons. Going forward, we are focused on the NPT review for conference next May, as well as achieving early entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Testament Treaty, the CTBT. A third, recovery and financial crisis. As I said in my General Assembly speech, markets may be bouncing back, but incomes, jobs, and people are not. That is why we have put forward a Global Jobs Pact. We are also creating a new global impact vulnerability alert system 
uh, giving us real-time data and analysis on the socioeconomic picture around the world so that governments can reach those who most need it. In Pittsburgh, the G20 leaders again promised to, to help the poorest countries. They pledged more balanced and sustainable growth in the future. Now we must hold them to their word. Ladies and gentlemen, let me cite a few other notable events at this uh, General Assembly. On Saturday last week, Secretary of State <coughs> of um, United States Clinton and I hosted an important meeting on food security uh, designed to build on the July, 8th, uh, July G8 uh, summit in L'Aquila, uh, where leaders announced a $220 uh, billion food security fund. For much of the past year, we have focused on immediate needs, uh, saving people from starving. Uh, today, we are moving more firmly toward a longer-term phase two, a working a revolution in the way we do agricultural development. We are focusing particularly on small farmers, most of them women. Our approach is about more than feeding the hungry. It is about empowering the poor. The food crisis may have fallen off the front pages, but it has not gone away, and I urge you to pay attention. Regarding the flu pandemic, the UN system has completed an assessment to help countries prioritize their needs. In recent days, nine countries agreed to make 10% of their pandemic vaccine supply available to countries in special need. Uh, this represents approximately uh, 50 million vaccines. Two vaccine manufacturers have agreed to donate 150 million vaccines. Others have agreed to provide reduced pricing. A number of donor countries have pledged financial and technical support, while others are exploring how they can help. With respect to peace and security, the group of friends of Myanmar uh, unanimously reaffirmed its support for the UN's out ongoing efforts, in particular on active and direct engagement with the government. I met yesterday with Prime Minister Tan Shen. I expect Myanmar to fully respond to the proposal I left with the senior leadership during my last visit to the country. The onus is on the government to create the necessary conditions for credible and inclusive elections. There should be dialogue with all of this in Myanmar. And of course, all political prisoners must be released, including Do Aung San Suu Kyi. I intend to continue to work through my for strenuous progress on political, humanitarian, and development challenges. I also met with the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka yesterday. The government has reaffirmed its commitment to allow displaced persons to return to their homes by January next year. We need no further evidence for the need to move forward. Just this past weekend, a confrontation took place between IDPs and Sri Lankan security forces in the many farms camps. Two children were shot and wounded. There is clearly a great deal of pressure on people on the ground. In coordination with the member states, I will continue to closely follow up on the implementation of the government's commitments, both personally and through my senior officials. Uh, this includes outstanding issues related to the freedom of movement and return of IDPs human rights accountability, and political reconciliation. I also had a chance to meet with the leaders of, on Cyprus and encourage them to seize the opportunity before them and to make full use of my good offices. There is a reasonable expectation within the international community that the leaders can soon arrive at a mutually acceptable uh, settlement. I'm deeply concerned about developments in Honduras. A state of emergency has increased tensions. 
I note that the Congress of Honduras, Honduras has rejected the suspension of civil liberties and urged that constitutional guarantees, including freedom of association, expression, and movement, be fully respected. Threats on the embassy of Brazil in Honduras are unacceptable. International law is clear. Sovereign immunity cannot be violated. Threats to the embassy staff and premises are intolerable. The Security Council has condemned such acts of intimidation. I do as well in the strongest terms. I once again appeal for the safety of President Zelaya. I urge all political actors to seriously commit to dialogue and regional mediation efforts. I reaffirm the readiness of the United Nations to assist in every way. I also met with the Vice Minister of the DPRK and underscored my concern about the humanitarian and human rights situation. In addition, of course, I addressed nuclear and other outstanding issues. Important discussions also took place on the Middle East, Somalia, and Pakistan. Finally, on Iran. In my meeting with the President Ahmadinejad, I said clearly and directly that the burden of proof is on Iran to demonstrate that its nuclear program is for peaceful purposes. I urged him to open the country's new structure to prompt and full inspection and to engage constructively in negotiations. Ladies and gentlemen, the 64th General Assembly shows a UN rising to the challenges of today's world. We are confronting the big issues of the day, climate change, disarmament, the financial crisis, and the Millennium Development Goals, key issues of peace and security. No nation can solve this alone. It takes nations united, which of course was the main theme of my General Assembly address this year. Now is our time. Uh, thank you very much.